I'm Marielena Giassi, and this is Currents. It's the changing face of education here in New York City. A look at two schools of thought. There's a great number of good public schools in this state and in this country, but for Catholic schools, it's part of the ministry, it's part of the mission to educate and form children to be loving, uh, productive adults. Plus, this native New Yorker is set to become Cardinal. We'll hear all about him. He's a Bronx boy, uh -huh. so he has that New York uh, style. He's great sense of humor. And a Queen's school is imparting some wisdom from above. Being in District 26 is one of our biggest marketing challenges. It is an excellent school district all the way through. As a result, we need to be better than the public schools. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Liz Palbus is on assignment in Rome. It's an ongoing effort in the Diocese of Brooklyn to keep Catholic education vital for years to come. Known as preserving the vision, the Catholic schools of Brooklyn and Queens have been transitioning to what is known as the academy model. The initiative calls for converting all Catholic elementary schools into academies by 2017. One of the benefits? Giving the schools independence from parishes. So far, the plan has been an unparalleled success. And it's been happening at a time when many are pushing for a new model in the public school system with the introduction of charter schools. But are Catholic schools and charter schools at odds with one another? Experts in both areas gathered recently at St. Francis College in Brooklyn Heights to examine that question. In the last decade, Catholic school enrollment has collapsed. If you lose 46% of your clients or your customers, to me, you're on the verge of collapse. The reason I organized this panel is because I became aware of research which shows that charter schools have had a deleterious effect on Catholic schools. I thought this was something that was problematic, and I wanted to bring a panel together to talk about this, including people who defend charter schools. There'll be a wide range of opinions on the podium. During the enactment of the charter school legislation, the issue of its impact on the parochial or Catholic school system never came up. Nobody talked about it. Um, it wasn't even on the radar screen. In 2000, we started in New York a new type of school called Charter School, which is a public school run by private individuals. And that, public, that charter school would get a tax subsidy from the government of about $14,000 per student. I think the fact that charter schools uh, end up uh, are, are not allowed to charge tuition, um, that plays a, a, strong, uh, a strong part in a, in a family's decision about where they want to send their child. It will be less expensive by the government subsidizing the private sector. And one of the reasons it, it is so expensive is because we don't have the subsidy in the private sector and it's costing so much more to educate those kids only in the government sector. The fact that more kids are in charter schools the state government in, in the city, city is paying $14,000 for each of those uh, children in the school. They could pay four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 to keep that child in a Catholic school or other independent religious schools, and they'd save money doing so. We're in an era of accountability in schooling, um, where, where parents are actually increasingly savvy about um, the options that they have in front of them. A lot of parents are finding in charter schools, schools that provide the same kind of values uh, other than strict and, and direct religious values, uh, but, the, but the hard work, discipline, a safe environment, the kind of things that a lot of families have, re, you know, uh, have relied upon Catholic schools for for years, they're starting to find in charter schools. So. While they may have the same values, the education is not a Catholic education. And there are certain values within the church that many families want to pass on to their children and have part of their upbringing. We need a robust system that supports families, regardless of what their choices are, whether it's home school, regular public school, charter school, independent religious school, the government has an obligation to support those families. The Catholic schools educate the whole person. Catholic schools exist because there's a mission and ministry to form children into loving, responsible, and productive adults. And there's a great number of good public schools in this state and in this country, but for Catholic schools, it's part of the ministry, it's part of the mission to educate and form children to be loving, uh, productive adults. Stay tuned. There's more currents ahead.
Less than two days before New York's Archbishop is elevated to Cardinal, we'll get the latest on him from Rome. That and the rest of the day's headlines, next. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Maria Elena Giassi. Coming up later, we'll go back to school and look at a transition for an academy in Queens. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Another big day in Rome for New York's Archbishop. Our Liz Fobles is there with the latest. With Cardinal designate Timothy Dolan's elevation fast approaching, he still maintains a very busy schedule. We caught up with him at Vatican Radio, where one of his guests was pontifical North American College seminarian David Ryder. Well, we spoke about my life at the North American College. I'm a seminarian there in the second year. So he was the rector there in the 1990s, and he was the one who sent me here to be a seminarian there. So we spoke a little bit about the college. If you ask anybody who works there in the maintenance crew, people who work in the finance office, anybody who was there when he was there, as soon as you say his name, they stop what they're doing, they turn around, their eyes get wide, they start smiling, and they tell you how much they admire him. And everybody has a personal story about something he did for their family, some act of love he did for them. So, and I know he's also a very great inspiration to the seminarians there. When he came two days ago, he was there for lunch, and his name was announced and he got a standing ovation, and the guys wouldn't stop clapping until he forced them to. So uh, his presence very much looms over us, even though it's been over 10 years now since he left. Right after his weekly address, the soon-to-be Cardinal shared his thoughts about his titular church, Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's a sign from the Holy Father that he knows what a gift the uh, Latino population is to the Archdiocese of New York. He's aware of the fact that all of America, North and South, venerate Mary under this beautiful title of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So it's, it, it was a, there was a real personal touch there, and I was honored. I snuck out there yesterday. I wasn't supposed to, so I put on a sweatshirt and went out. This parish, <laughs> first of all, the parish is hardly some big cathedral. It's just a very, a very beautiful, simple church in the middle of Monte Mario. They have a daily uh, daycare program for the elderly. They have a vibrant catechetical program for the young people. They have a daily hot lunch program. I'm just, for the poor people in the area, I'm just sensing this as I'm walking around. And they have a, 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 commu a neighborhood of Rome where there's a lot of immigrants. So they have, they were tell the people were saying we have a lot of Africans, uh, we have some Asians here. So I'm thinking, wow, it sounds like New York. <laughs> so I felt very much at home. Back in this country, the bishops are encouraging passage of a bill to counter the recently announced contraception mandate. President Obama had announced last week that religious organizations would still be required to let employers have contraception included in their health coverage, with the cost passed along to the insurance company. Cardinal Daniel DiNardo says arguing that employers will not be subsidizing that coverage, quote, runs up against the reality that the coverage will still be part of the overall plan paid for by employers. In a letter to all senators, Cardinal DiNardo urges senators to support the Respect for Rights of Conscious Act. He says the legislation will allow employers to offer health insurance without violating their consciences. Meanwhile, Another letter objecting to the mandate, this one signed by a group of Catholic leaders. Archbishop Dolan, Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez, Catholic University President John Garvey, and Notre Dame President John Jenkins are among those who signed the letter. In it, the leaders say the contraception mandate puts many faith-based organizations, quote, in an untenable position. They ask the administration, Congress, and all Americans to work with them to reform the law. Meanwhile, the bishops say it is wrong to claim that they never supported health care reform. Earlier this week, White House Press Secretary Jay Carney stated that the bishops never supported health care reform to begin with. Stockton Bishop Bla Stephen Blair says that is not the case. He says the church was persistently and consistently advocating what they felt was an overdue national priority. Meanwhile, there's new opposition to the contraception mandate from some state leaders. Catholic News Agency reports that 12 attorneys general say they will sue over the rule. In a letter to Health and Human Services Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, the attorneys general say the mandate is an impermissible violation 
of the Constitution's First Amendment, virtually unparalleled in American history. And could it be a sign of another federal mandate? From Washington State, the House has passed a bill that would require health insurance companies that cover maternity care to also pay for abortions. According to EWTN News, the bill would not have any exemptions for religious groups. Sister Sharon Park, who heads the Washington State Catholic Conference, says that Washington would become the first state to mandate abortion coverage. The bill now heads to the Washington State Senate. Closer to home, a Philadelphia judge is refusing to step down from a sex abuse case after she made a derogatory remark against the Catholic Church. Defense lawyers for former Secretary of Clergy for the Philadelphia Archdiocese called on Judge Teresa Sarmina to recuse herself after she said anyone who does not believe there was widespread abuse in the church is living on another planet. The remark came during a hearing at which the judge and lawyers for both sides we're reviewing questions for a jury questionnaire. We turn now to Honduras, where a chaplain is sharing his story after a fire at the prison where he worked killed more than 300 inmates. The priest tells Catholic News Service that prison was detaining more than three times the number of inmates it was designed to hold. He described the conditions in the prison as inhumane. Officials in Honduras told local media that the fire was possibly caused by a short circuit or a prisoner lighting a mattress on fire. Meanwhile, a Sudanese bishop says the world has forgotten the people in his dioceses. Bishop Makram Max Gassis tells Vatican news agency Fides that people in his diocese, which straddles the border of Sudan and South Sudan, are dying of starvation and bombings. The area has been the site of ongoing battles between the Sudanese government and the Sudan People's Liberation Movement North. And the Prime Minister of Ireland says his country's government will not reconsider the decision to close its Vatican embassy. Prime Minister Enda Kenny says the closure will remain under review. He rejected a claim that the embassy was needed to deal with issues including child protection. The decision to close the embassy came after reports of widespread abuse at Catholic institutions in Ireland going back decades. And meanwhile, the British, excuse me, the Irish Prime Minister says Pope Benedict will be treated with respect should he visit Ireland. The Pope has been asked to attend the 50th Eucharistic Congress, which will take place in Ireland this June. Stay tuned. There's more currents ahead. Just ahead. From New York to the Red Hat, we'll hear about a native New Yorker who's set to become Cardinal. Just because he's such a deep lover of the church, uh, he kind of embodies it with all the different areas of the church that he has served yeah. and all the different peoples in, that, in those areas. Welcome back. This Saturday, New York Archbishop Timothy Dolan is not the only American being named a Cardinal. A New York native will also join him in the College of Cardinals. Archbishop Edwin O'Brien was born in the Bronx and ordained by Cardinal Francis Spellman for the Archdiocese of New York way back in 1965. During his career, Archbishop O'Brien served the Church and the Archdiocese in many roles before Pope John Paul II selected him to be Archbishop for the Military Services in 1997. Then in 2007, Pope Benedict chose Cardinal Designate O'Brien to lead the Baltimore Archdiocese before tapping him to lead the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, a Catholic order that helps Christians in the Holy Land. Unlike Archbishop Dolan, Cardinal Designate O'Brien was also, at one time, the rector of the North American College in Rome. And that's how he came to know our next guest, Father Joseph Fonte of the Diocese of Brooklyn, who was a student during the Archbishop O'Brien's time as rector. Father Fonte recently sat down with our news director, Ed Wilkinson. Father Fonte, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you, Ed. Always good to be with you. Of course, we want to talk about Cardinal Designate Edwin O'Brien, good friend of yours. How did you first get to know him? Well, Bishop McGovro, uh, happy memory, uh, sent me to Rome to finish my studies for the priesthood in 88. And in uh, 1990, would have been mid-1990, uh, uh, the then Monsignor O'Brien was assigned as the rector to our college. Uh -huh. What kind of a guy is he? How would you describe his personality? 
Oh, he's a very affable and uh, friendly man, um, serious uh, but sincere, mm -hmm. um, very well read, um, puts a lot of time and detail into the matters at hand that he's working with, um, very considerate and a uh, very deep man of prayer mm -hmm. uh, and reflection. Yeah. As a seminary rector, uh, a lot of guys, of course, naturally, seminarians, will look up to that person as a role model. Uh, what do you think are the qualities that uh, Cardinal Designate O'Brien would, would uh, g give out as a, as a rector? What kind of a role model would he be? I think he stays the course. He has shown to be the importance of uh, remaining steadfast in, uh, in faith. Uh, regardless of how the currents move in the church or in the world itself, uh, you know, that one is you know, secure, and if one is secure in Christ, one has what he needs uh, to do his, uh, his service uh, in, with joy. Um, it's one thing that you'll see with him, uh, even within that uh, serious undertaking, there's a, a joy within him. He's a man's man, he's very... Uh, uh, very much so, and it's an inspiration for us. It was, uh, especially as a younger man, but definitely now uh, in the years of friendship with him, uh, mm -hmm. he's someone who you can approach, uh, and as I said, is, is, is thought out, um, and, and con concerned with um, you know, the whole person, uh, and, and wanting them to be uh, um, put together in a manner of speaking that, you know, keeps them faithful and focused <coughs> on, on what is right, what is true, mm -hmm. what is just. Yeah. I've met him a couple of times, and like you say, he's very approachable. He's a very personable, very approachable guy. As soon as you say hello to him or introduce yourself to him, he makes you feel welcome right yeah, away, right? Very much so. He's a yeah. Bronx boy, uh -huh. so he has that New York uh, style. He's a great sense of humor, great uh -huh. wit, yeah. and um, he's, he's just has a beautiful smile. Yeah. You said he was a man's man, and uh, of course he was... Uh, an army chaplain and actually saw a, a tour of duty in Vietnam. Does he ever talk about that? Or what do, you, what do you think that experience in Vietnam had as an impact on his life? Well, his first assignment uh, was to West Point. He was mm -hmm. chaplain of West Point. Right. And uh, I think that began his, his admiration and love for the, the men and women in military service. Uh, and then he himself enlisted in being a chaplain in Vietnam. Um, and so his, uh, I think being intimately connected with the formation of uh, an officer, let alone a soldier, really gave him that sense that uh, uh, you know, th their, their service was one of honor and, and respectability. And, and then he took on that in, in wanting to really be uh, one with them, uh, going through all the drills. Uh, it's often spoke of that he uh, was uh, with the parachute unit and jumping out of planes, right, had quite right. a few jumps. Yeah. Um, but then as later on, as he would, uh, be um, elevated to the office of bishop, ordained a bishop, which is today, 16 years. Is that February 6th uh -huh. uh, was his date of, uh, of appointment. Um, he, uh, you know, he embraced the service of being the uh, military uh, chaplain, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, or, um, bishop of the military ordinariate. And um, he really had a great loyalty and love to, to the uh, to the armed forces. Uh, it was probably the one time I really say that I saw him really uh, lamenting a, a loss when he, when he, when he had to separate uh, his service to the military. Uh -huh. He, he has, holds a, a special place in his heart for the men and women in, uh, in uniform. Sure. He has a great uh, diverse background. He also served as communications director and uh, secretary, yeah, to, secretary uh, to cardinals. To right. What, how will that enable him to be uh, a, a better cardinal? Well, I would say that, you know, he's had, as you mentioned, a very uh, illustrious uh, service in the church and it, many different hats he's worn. Um, he's had the advantage of, uh, of interaction with so many different persons and peoples in, uh, in the church and, uh, and aspects in which the church seeks to, you know, to serve the, uh, the world community. Uh, so he, uh, I think he, he brings with it the expertise of, of knowledge of, of that service, uh, the wisdom of, of mentors that he's had mm -hmm. in, in, the, in his years of, of priestly uh, of service. And um, I think he's, uh, you know, I think he, he, just because he's such a deep lover of the church, uh, he kind of embodies it with all the different 
areas of the church that he has served yeah. all the different peoples in that in those areas sure. and you'll be there in rome to see i this, will right? be happily uh <laughs> witnessing and cheering for both he and uh, cardinal desert dolan who right. was a rector also of sure. our college we'll have a safe trip and thank give him much. our regards and uh, thank you so much for coming by and sharing your uh, uh knowledge about uh, cardinal designate o'brien thank you ed Stay tuned, there's more currents ahead. When we return, a new way of educating the next generation. We'll find out how one school has adapted. We believe in professional learning. Just because you're now a certified teacher doesn't mean the learning stops. Smart teachers, smart adults make smart kids. Finally tonight, change. It's something that's not always welcome, but in the case of the transformation at Catholic schools in Brooklyn and Queens, the results have, so far, been very positive. Elementary schools across the Diocese of Brooklyn are transitioning to the academy model, giving them independence from the local parishes, but still maintaining an education that is distinctly Catholic. In some neighborhoods, the academies have some stiff competition at the public school level, but for our next school, the situation has only made it stronger. Divine Wisdom Academy in Douglaston is our latest School of the Week. Divine Wisdom Catholic Academy is a very special place. Why? This is not your grandparents' Catholic school. One of the challenges is that we're located in Douglaston, Queens. And Douglas and Queens is home of the number one school district in New York City. Being in District 26 is one of our biggest marketing challenges. It is an excellent school district all the way through. As a result, we need to be better than the public schools. It's not good enough to just be as good as the public schools. We need to be better. We believe in professional learning. Just because you're now a certified teacher doesn't mean the learning stops. Smart teachers, smart adults, make smart kids. There's always something new coming out, a new method, a new idea that can benefit the children. You can't stay one way for, for 15, 20 years. It's not going to work. It won't be effective teaching. Our teachers are constantly going out into other schools, PD workshops, to learn the new innovative ways that kids learn. We're also well aware of it. Every student doesn't learn the same way. We've pretty much thrown out a one-size-fits-all approach and we celebrate diversity. Diversity of learners, diversity of learning. You're teaching 25 to 30 different learners, and you almost have to have 25 to 30 different lesson plans tailored around to each individual learner. The board is very involved um, to our benefit. The advantage of an academy model is that it brings more individuals in on a volunteer basis to help with the running and managing of the school. In this day and age, we don't have the luxury of the numbers of priests that we had many years ago, and so it's time to let the, the pastors focus on running the parish and keeping Catholic churches and Catholic parishes alive and well, and allowing the schools to run themselves with oversight from those pastors. The board of directors at, at the Divine Wisdom are a phenomenal group of men and women. They're not the type who just come in once a month for a perfunctory a meeting. We're willing to do a lot for our students. This is something that as board members we believe in. Everybody on our board has either had children who are alumni of this school or are alumni themselves. Their experiences here were wonderful. They want that to continue for many generations to come. I'm not your typical Catholic school educator. This is my 31st year in education, but the first 29 I spent in various roles in the New York City Department of Ed. He has taught us a lot about education, where it needs to go, and what we need to do to challenge our teachers and make them the best teachers possible so that our students get the best education possible. We have a sense of community here and a sense of faith here. It, it is the only place in Douglaston where you can go and learn about math and science, but also learn about the teachings of Jesus Christ. Catholic education is important because all students have the right and should have the ability to attend an education that is steeped in moral values and traditions. I've always felt most comfortable in this kind of environment. It's what I grew up in. I went to Catholic school for everything from nursery to college. We want students to have religion embedded in every subject that they learn and price values in every subject in everything that they do every day. 
Divine Wisdom has a bright future. Every year our enrollment's growing, everyone's learning. The school community was just the best kept secret in Douglaston. I've been in thousands upon thousands of classrooms over the years involved in education. I would say proudly that I would be happy to have my children in this school with any of these teachers. I feel like I'm doing a better job than I ever did before. The past three years have been a much different experience than the previous. To work with such a dedicated faculty and staff, I know that the students are going to just flourish. And that has been really the driver that has allowed this school to be so successful and to really meet the needs of all of the students. That is all for this edition of Currents. Be sure to visit us online at CurrentsNY.net. You can also connect with us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Marielena Giassi. Thank you for watching and have a good night.